Hello, and welcome to Fiction Fans, a podcast where we read books and other spooky things too. I'm Lily. And I'm Sarah. And today we will be discussing The Other Black Girl by Zakiya Harris, or maybe Zakia. I probably should have looked that up. My instinct is Zakia because that's just how I pronounce vowels automatically, but I do not actually know either. We always disagree on which syllable to stress, and I could have done research. I didn't. That's on me. Before we get into that even farther, (laughs) Sarah, I want to ask you what something good that happened lately, because we both know that we had a ladies weekend. Yes, we had a wonderful weekend with the other women of our family, which was my good thing and your good thing. It was a wonderful thing. Yes, Yes, it was an all around good thing. Uh, It was a really lovely weekend. And I don't think that I'd seen some of our family since pre-pandemic. One of our aunts I see all the time because we go to theater together. And I saw your mother when I visited you, but I don't think I've seen anyone else since pre-pandemic. Well, it was very nice. It was an emotional roller coaster. We laughed, we cried. We ate a lot of good food, drank a lot of wine. We compared oysters at a lot of different restaurants. <laughs> <laughs> but not enough oysters. There can never be too many oysters. It's true. Yeah. It was just all around lovely. And that's our joint great thing. Except also the space program blew up an asteroid recently. So that was also great. <laughs> Stealing our thunder. All right. <laughs> How dare. They didn't actually blow it up. They just altered its course by 1%. But that's enough to miss Earth. If that was a problem, that was ever going to happen. And now we know that we could alter an asteroid's direction by 1%. So that's very cool. That's some sci-fi bullshit. Saying that they blew it up is cooler, though. (laughs) Well, yeah. Uh, I was watching the... not. I wasn't watching it live, but I was watching the live stream. And the camera... I had to ask Daniel because I was like what is going on here? And the camera was on the rocket going to hit the asteroid. And so you're just seeing it get bigger and bigger and bigger on the screen. (laughs) And then everything goes blank. And I wish I had known that going into it because I would have been less confused and more impressed. (laughs) That does sound very cool, actually. It was very cool. I highly recommend everyone to go watch that just for like science. (laughs) For science. When will we ever need to blow up an asteroid? I don't know. But if we need to, we can. More importantly, Sarah, what are you drinking this evening? I am drinking some Blindwood cider. Good old Blindwood. I'm shocked. I know. This is so out of character for me. I never drink cider and I never drink Blindwood cider. Well, just to keep the shock rolling, I'm drinking Francia. (laughs) (laughs) No one could have guessed. I didn't see that coming. No, that's never happened before on air. Sarah, what's something great that you've read recently? (laughs) I haven't been doing a lot of reading, but I did get into a sea drama, a Chinese drama on Netflix called Love Between Fairy and Devil, which is the absolute worst title ever. It's garbage, but the show is very, very good and I'm enjoying it immensely. (laughs) Well, that doesn't count, but we'll allow it. I'm reading the subtitles. (laughs) <laughs> that counts as reading. <laughs> All right. Oh, but that like the the enemies to lovers is just like chef's kiss, and like there's a love triangle, and I'm normally not a fan of love triangles, but I like it really works here, and it's just it's very good. Like it's great. I'm loving it. I'll take your word for it. And there like there's a body swap, <laughs> and the way that the main male actor is able to like just embody the kind of ditzy female character and like he's so different from how he normally portrays like when he's his regular character it's it's excellent good i'm glad (laughs) you're welcome i attempted to read ahead on our podcast list and it has scrambled my brain i am not one of those people who can read more than one book at a time and 
uh, that's going to be a situation. Luckily, we edit this podcast. So every time I get confused, <laughs> I will just cut it out. And that's my life right now. More work for you, but. Yeah, well, better than cramming the book at the last minute tomorrow. This is true. That is what I'm going to be doing. But you've read it before. No. Oh, I have not. Am I ahead of you right now on our reading? In our podcast reading, I think you are if you started our next book. Oh my God. That's so exciting. <laughs> That's never happened before. It doesn't happen very often. I'm I'm calling this the first time. I finished the other black girl before you did though. Yeah. That's usually how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> That's normal. Anyway. The other black girl by we're not sure. I'm gonna Google it right now so that I don't make an ass of myself the whole time. We both pronounced it wrong. Apparently it's Zakia. We're gonna call her Harris the whole time because that's how you talk about authors. But now I know, and that's what's important. Also important is that I found this book on a list of horror novels, and that sure did affect the way I went into this book. I I have so many opinions on the genre of this novel. <laughs> and yeah, I think I might have fucked up a little bit. <laughs> well, I think you fucked up partially because it's all about like East Coast publishing. You'd think I would have known that. <laughs> the description was like, oh, it's a horror novel about the publishing industry. And I was like, those sound like things I like. And then I started the book. And it was like, oh, yeah, New York. And I was like, fuck me. <laughs> I feel like this might have been solved if you had a tendency to read the synopsis or the book blurb. Or just connect the fact that the publishing industry also means the East Coast, which is one thing I am somewhat interested in and another thing I could not care less about. And it was very frustrating. <laughs> But that was, again, entire, like, the book told me what it was, and then I didn't listen. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I've never heard a description of New York that made me go, I can understand why people want to live there. See, I don't have that problem. Like, I love New York. I like visiting it for a weekend. I would love to live in New York. I mean, I don't know if I would want to live there for the rest of my life, but like five years. Yeah, absolutely. Gross. Why? But the theater, <laughs> there's so much good theater in New York and it's a much shorter plane trip to the UK. Uh, neither of those sound like a good enough reason to me. Well, that's because you don't like the theater like I do. <laughs> well, maybe. Apparently you have to wear stockings to job interviews there and fuck that entirely. <laughs> <laughs> Or, I mean, I think that's still the case in certain industries. Like, I don't think that's specific to New York. Maybe. I worked at a, at a firm where stockings in an interview were not, like, necessary, necessary. But if you wore a skirt, you probably should be wearing stockings in, in, like, in your interview. I mean, not necessary, necessary is the whole point. It was not an automatic no. Unless you're saying it was. It was not an automatic no. And I just can't imagine that level of pedantry over someone's appearance. I mean, I didn't think that it was an automatic no here either, because Nella has a huge old run in her stocking and she still gets hired. Well, when she was dealing with that situation in the book, my response would have been, just take off your stockings and then no one will notice you have a run in them. But that was not her solution. I think that's a you thing and not an industry-wide, like, statement. It's true. <laughs> that she has to wear stockings. I am very clear on the industries and the locales that I will thrive in, and neither of them are publishing or the East Coast. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what I expected. That was literally what this book was about, and so much of it was elitist snobbery, and I spent the whole time going, holy shit, uh, I'm so glad I made the life choices that I did. And that was not the point of the book. And maybe that's a me problem. Maybe that's a being from California problem. I don't know. I think that's just a you problem. I just like, fuck. Fuck New York. 
I really loved the deep dive into the publishing industry and the problems inherent to the publishing industry that this book provided. Were they new to you? No, they weren't new. I mean, like, I'm on Twitter. I know all of that. I See, there were two parts of this book. One part of this book was there are these problems with the publishing industry that I'm already aware of. And so dealing with them point by point was extremely excruciating. And then the other point was dealing with racism in an office environment, which I'm not familiar with. And it was also excruciating, but in a like informative way. And so I just had to suck it up and learn about it, which was good and part of why we chose this book. And that didn't make the book hard. Well, it made it the book hard to read, but it didn't make the book bad to read. There is just a lot going on and not a lot of it was fun. (laughs) Yeah, I would not call this a fun book by any means. A good book, an excellent book, although I have to say not a book that I enjoyed both because of the genre and because it just, it was depressing. (laughs) There's a lot of depressing stuff in this. We're still not talking about the genre because that's entirely spoilers and I have so many opinions. I know, but like (laughs) we've said, you found it, you found it on a list of horror novels. Horror novels are not my genre of choice. Like horror is not my genre of choice. I wish the book was more horror. I feel like I would have been able to engage with it more. I wish it was less horror. (laughs) I know you do. And I I thank you for humoring me. This whole month is going to be you humoring me. And we're kicking off with a really tough one. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) One thing that I actually quite enjoyed about this book, similarly about, you know, broadening my horizons. I know I sound like the worst white person right now. I'm like, a little bit. This book uh, broadened my horizons so much, but I sure did have to Google a lot of hairstyles. (laughs) I have to admit that I didn't Google anything because I very rarely Google things when I read. See, I, mm, no, I, I Google things when I read. And I especially Google things when I'm reading something that I picked specifically to challenge my expectations because the whole point is to learn something. And if I don't Google it, then what was the point? There was a hairstyle that when I Googled it, the pictures I saw, I associated very strongly with the 90s. And I did not know that it was not just a 90s thing. It's actually a very important cultural thing. And I know that now. So that's nice. Yeah, that is nice. Literally, the only thing I did not have to Google was, well, I guess technically I could have, but the curl ratings, how people with textured hair have like the different a number and letter rating to define how textured their hair is. That was the only thing I was familiar with. (laughs) Uh, Oh, and the fact that cornrows exist. I didn't have to Google that. I'm not that bad. I applaud you. Thank you. That's why I brought it up. To be (laughs) complimented for how open-minded I am. No, it's not. I'm making fun of myself and hopefully that comes across. But, uh... There's a lot going on, and I feel like so much of the actual content we're going to have to cover in the spoiler section, which is going to make the non-spoiler section (laughs) sound so surface level and so crappy, but I don't want to spoil anything because the twists were very good. Yeah, I feel like this is a book where you really can't talk about it without going into the spoilers, at least not if you want to talk about it in any depth. One could argue that like intersectional feminism is depth, (laughs) which is literally the only way I can interact with this book without going into the plot. It did allow me to sympathize with the main character. I had to look this up. So there's sympathy and there's empathy and which one's which always fucks me up. Sympathy is the one where you are sympathetic now i'm just using the word in the definition (laughs) you identify via personal experience whereas empathy is you recognize that this is a human being going through a shitty experience or it doesn't have to be shitty i suppose but it always is when you talk about it no one talks about empathizing with a positive experience i think there's definitely an aspect of negativity to empathizing and sympathy like I send my sympathies. You never say that for a good thing. (laughs) True. 
that could be a words are weird, but I am definitely able to sympathize with the main character via misogyny. Obviously, Nella is dealing with so much more than, I mean, I haven't even really had to deal with misogyny because I'm a fucking snowflake. But when you're reading about this character dealing with office politics and interacting with her coworkers, there is an element that I am able to access as a technical minority, <laughs> as a woman in the office, even if I've never actually had to face that myself. There's really no way to talk about this that makes me look good just because like my <laughs> life is so fucking charmed. And I feel like acknowledging that is the only way to go. <laughs> I mean, we we both have a lot of privilege. Should I not even try to sympathize? But that also seems bad. I mean, if if there are aspects to Nella's experience that you can sympathize with, then I'd, yeah, sympathize with them. I have actually good things to say, but they're all spoilers. <laughs> uh, you have a comment about this book being horror, and I have comments about it. So I did, I did have this comment about, obviously, this is horror genre. Whether or not we agree with it being called horror, we'll get into. But my comment was like, I think the real horror is what Black people and people of color have to go through in the publishing industry. And I do think that disregard, I'm calling it the real horror just because that's the genre. But like, that is really horrific. And Nella goes through a lot of really horrific things unrelated to, you know, the genre stuff, just regular office life issues that are just really bad. And I think that that's a thing that a lot of people in the industry actually deal with. Like, this is not something that Harris is exaggerating for the sake of the book. Well, way to cut off my rebuttal at the knees. <laughs> <laughs> uh, horrific is not the same thing as horror. Right. And, and I'm just calling it horror because that's the genre. I... <sighs> Okay, it's a it's a play on the genre. <laughs> no, I know, but it <laughs> makes it very hard to talk about because I don't want to. Okay, we're just gonna breeze through the non-spoiler section because I can't. <laughs> All right, here's something that we can talk about without spoiling anything. This is a fiction book. However, I personally interpreted a lot of the contents much more sincerely than I ever would any fiction book, just because the main character is dealing with racism in the workplace, and that all felt much more genuine than I would ever ascribe. So I don't know if I completely agree with that. I mean, obviously, like, I can't tell you how to feel about a book or how to interpret a book. And we were talking about this a little bit earlier. And I've been thinking about it ever since you like wrote it down in our notes. And I think that for me, the reason why I assign a lot more sincerity to Nella's experiences is because we don't read a lot of fiction of this genre, not horror specifically, but like fiction that so closely borders real life. Realistic fiction. Yeah. Yeah. And so like, I think there's a whole swath of books that are similarly honest about experiences while fictionalizing you know characters and we just don't like come into contact with those a lot that's fair I do like that excuse <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that's also part of what the book is poking fun at and that's part of why I'm being so open with my not struggles to identify with the book but so much of the narrative is about how a person of color has to represent their entire demographic and how white people look to people of color to tell them everything about every experience. And the novel itself is very upfront about that. And I feel like it's asking the reader to interact with their own biases when it comes to those things in the office. And so I think it would be disingenuous if I was like, oh, yeah, everything was great. It didn't make me question anything. 
<laughs> no, I mean, I like, I think you're, you're absolutely spot on there. Like the, the novel is saying, Hey, white person, look at how you interact with people of color. And yeah. But unfortunately, I tend to be very pithy on this podcast, which makes me sound like an absolute <laughs> douchebag. And that's my only setting. <laughs> but all of my very good, thoughtful observances are going to be huge ass spoilers. So let's just move right along. First of all, why should you read this book? If you don't hate the East Coast as much as I do, you'll probably enjoy it a lot more. <laughs> I think that's one aspect where I did enjoy it a lot more than you did. God, every word about office culture and just general New Yorkiness, I was like, fuck that. <laughs> it made it very difficult. There was basically no reprieve for me from the horror of this book because everything else was like, fuck that entirely with a pointy <laughs> stick <laughs> it was it was a very pointed commentary on the publishing industry which is very new york and east coast and if you are into that sort of thing then you will probably enjoy this book and if you like a, a little side of horror it does get there it gets to horror eventually but we're going to talk about that in the spoiler section I don't think it's a spoil. I mean, it's listed as a horror novel, so it's not a spoiler to say that. I don't think. I mean, we've also we've talked about it being a horror novel, so I'm just the timing of it. I think is meaningful, but anyway, <laughs> I think this book also does a good job of asking the reader to question themselves and also question themselves for why reading a book by. a a person of color makes them question themselves. And why is that her responsibility? And basically, uh, it's very important and you're going to feel bad, but it's going to feel good at the end. It's like pulling out a splinter. All right, let's get to spoilers so that I can stop sounding like a total idiot. <laughs> <laughs> to avoid spoilers, skip to 4320. Okay, so my first spoiler comment is going to be about the ending. And I was really disappointed by the ending. It's not neatly tied up. There's no, like, big resolution. She doesn't, like, win. Bad things happen. And that's not what I wanted <laughs> from the end of this book. <laughs> oh, that is absolutely just why I like horror better than you do, I think. Probably. I mean, you like spooky stuff more than I do in general. Yes. But also open-ended endings. I wouldn't call it open-ended. It was just bad. <laughs> well, okay. Yeah. Bad. It was pretty close-ended. I was just bad. <laughs> it's just bad. I want my happy ending. Yeah. Bad, not as in a bad ending, but bad as in pessimistic to clarify. And un it was an unhappy ending. Unhappy. I would argue, yes, it's an unhappy ending, not an unsatisfying one. I was unsatisfied with it because it was unhappy. But that is a me thing. I mean, like, my issues with the ending are a me thing and what I want out of a book and me not really, like, this not being a, a genre aimed at my preferences. Like, that's all on me. That's not, that has nothing to do with the book itself. <laughs> oh, I feel the same way about the general ennui of the book. No, not ennui. What's the word I'm thinking of? Ambiance? No. Anyway, so this book is about the only Black employee of a publishing agency. And then they hire a second Black employee. And they are in competition. And most of the book you are wondering, is this just regular employee competition or is there something sinister happening? Except you know there's something sinister happening because you found this book under the horror genre. And it turns out that's correct. <laughs> <laughs> I spent a lot of the time reading this going, and this just feels like a thriller to me like maybe a little political intrigue just because of the workplace politics 
it did not get horror until like the last 20% of the book. And I can say that very specifically because I read it as an ebook, which was a problem. <laughs> <laughs> but what you're saying, I mean, Nella ends up being assimilated into the coalition of other Black girls who are the League of Complacent. Am I using the phrase Uncle Tom correctly? Probably not. But they they tear other Black women down in order for themselves to succeed and then kiss up to their white employers. And it's toes the line so delicately between this is just a shitty thing that actually happens with maybe there's actually a brainwashing conspiracy (laughs) that I wasn't really sold on this being a horror book for a very long time. But then actually the way it ends with Nella, the main character, ultimately succumbing to the brainwashing, to me felt like that clinched it as horror because that's just how horror ends, right? It's dreadful. Like in that it makes you feel full of dread and it nailed that pretty well. I like, so part of my issue is that I felt that there were a lot of unanswered questions with Nella being assimilated. Like what happens with her white boyfriend? What happens with her best friend, Malaika? Malaika, I don't know how to pronounce it. Like there are all of these things that I want to know that I feel like if she hadn't been assimilated would maybe have been wrapped up. And I feel like they weren't wrapped up for me. Mm, I was okay with that. Yeah, but I wanted to know. No, I know that. I think that's the difference between like a mystery and a horror. Whereas like with mystery, you want your questions answered. Or at least I do personally. (laughs) I mean, I want my questions answered regardless of genre. But I will concede that I think with mystery, you generally get everything wrapped up neatly. And with horror, maybe you don't. Part of the horror is that realization that everything is not okay. I just recall so many, so many horror movies where you get the end of the movie and everything's fine. And then you watch the credits. And at the end of the credits, there's the scene that implies that the monster isn't actually dead. And that is Nella showing up at the new publishing agency to continue this awful system that had destroyed her. That was the after credit scene, in my opinion. And it ties up this book so neatly, not in all of her personal plot lines, because her personhood wasn't the point. Yeah, I mean, like, that's that's fair. It, uh, ultimately, this just is not my genre. I think that's where we're at, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you for indulging me. Yeah, and that's not a, like I said, that was not a fault of the book. That's me as a reader not being the the reader for this book. And I think that's just something that when I ask you to read a horror novel, (laughs) we are accepting is probably going to happen. Yeah, I mean, we could have foreseen this. We did foresee this. Yeah. I will still read horror novels for Spooky Month and all of the Spooky Months going forward. But also... This book played with my emotions so hard because I came into it expecting a horror novel. And then I was about to say 90% of the book, but I actually know the percentage. It was 75. And 75% of the book was not what I would call horror genre. It was just just horrifying. Exactly. Because you're reading about this young woman's experiences and how she had to deal with all of this absolute garbage. And that's uncomfortable. It's not fun. (laughs) I didn't enjoy the process of reading this book. The book was very good. I enjoyed the book, but like actually reading it was extremely uncomfortable. And I, I feel like that was part of the point was like, you have to confront the realities of these experiences yeah i mean i i agree that the point the the non-horror genre points of the book are intentionally uncomfortable and intentionally horrifying and also intentionally mirror actual experiences like like we've talked about already but that is the point of the book i think it's interesting that earlier you said 
well, I'm, I'm just picking on you now. <laughs> I'm going to do it anyway, but I acknowledge that I'm doing it. Uh, it is horrifying. The experiences that, I'm, that this young. I'm saying again. I'm saying horror because that's the genre of the book. Okay, but in my opinion, the actual horror. Well, again, this is me as a reader. What I always find the most disturbing is someone distrusting their own perception, and that's probably just me. What I find particularly scary, just in general, is not trusting yourself. And that is absolutely a huge recurring theme in this book because Nella is constantly second guessing herself if what she's experiencing is, just like we were saying, supernatural or extra. I guess not supernatural, but extra sci fi horror scary or just regular workplace garbage scary. But the entire scheme of the villains is turning Black women against each other. And so at the end, Nella is even questioning Malaika, her best friend, her one true blue ride or die. And she's wondering if she can trust this other woman. And that is the scary thing to me. The the horror of this book, the true evil of Richard Wagner is turning these people who ought to trust each other against themselves. And creating no safe haven. And that's that's scary. It's bad and scary. (laughs) I agree that that is like the true evil of this book and and Richard's true evil. But I stand by my statement of the experiences of people of color in publishing being like the actual quote unquote horror, the actual horrific thing, because that is a very like true to life experience it also gets the most page time yeah the fact that it so closely mirrors what i see real people talking about on twitter about their own real experiences is for me what i find like the most horrifying because that's like real life well that means you're a more empathetic person than me (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Which I have determined by looking up the differences between those words. So you mentioned the ending feeling unsatisfying, and I argued against that a little bit, just as far as the general arc of the novel and horror conventions. But what I had the most questions about was Kendra Ray, because we see Nella going through this crazy brainwashing subterfuge but we also find out that her idol had gone through the same thing decades earlier and fled she sort of escaped the situation and then she comes back to help nella but it doesn't totally work well it doesn't work out at all nella gets got and we don't know what happens with kendra ray even though she's one of the first perspect she's the first perspective character And that, to me, is the biggest unknown. It doesn't make me unhappy. It just makes me very unhappy. (laughs) (laughs) I definitely, I mean, like you, I wanted to know more about what was going on with Kendra Ray at the end of the novel. Or, like, what happens to her, I should say. But that didn't leave me with questions the way that Owen and Malaika did. Because Nella didn't have a personal relationship with Kendra. A a two-sided personal relationship with Kendra Ray. So I feel like I have more questions about her relationship with Malaika because Malaika is a proud Black woman who Nella seeks refuge in for most of the book until she starts being turned. And it seems like that's where more of the tension is because Malaika is trying to take steps, active steps, during this process that Nella is resisting. And Owen, her boyfriend, doesn't even have that opportunity because Nella doesn't tell him what's going on. And part of that is the tension of race that we're seeing play out in personal relationships, not just professional ones. Because Malaika is also a Black woman, whereas Owen is white. 
And so she just doesn't tell him a lot of stuff, which makes sense until you realize that she's being taken advantage of. And then you're like, no, tell everyone you trust and they'll help you. Why? (laughs) But I feel like his role is going to be more easily absorbed by this crazy brainwashing cult because he is white and that's part of controlling her. And I, I feel like that was some of the notes that even took on her was, well, she has a white boyfriend, so she'll be easy to absorb. I mean, I don't, I don't disagree with you, but that doesn't make me want to like know how things play out with him any less. Yeah, fair. I really liked him. I will say when I was starting to read like the first half of the book, I knew this was a horror novel and I had notes. I was like, I really hope Owen doesn't end up being a bad guy. <laughs> I Yeah, I kept expecting that he would be part of the horror. Oh, but it's it's nice that he wasn't. He was just an unsuspecting side character that only wants what's best for Nella and doesn't even know what's going on with her to be scared about it. But I feel like he he was a good boyfriend. I think he would have been upset <laughs> and tried. I think so. I think he would have tried to help. Oh, that moment when Malaika, you can tell that she knows that there's something going on. She tries to take Nella's phone to send the proof that there's actually this huge conspiracy going on. And that scene kind of ends unconfirmed. But like, you know that Nella never sends it because otherwise the scene would have ended not unconfirmed. Well, Nella Nella specifically says like it had been a couple of weeks and she still hadn't sent it. Yeah, that's after though. I'm saying the scene on the subway. Oh, the, the scene, you mean like the scene by itself? Yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah. The fact that that ends open-ended is like, yeah, that's not, that's exactly what's not going to happen. And Malika was right. She should have taken the phone and sent it herself. She was a good friend and she knew what was happening. And And you (sighs) know, like when you, when you go into that scene, you know that like Nella has unwittingly started the conversion process. Well, she's literally being drugged. It's horrifying. The lack of personal exigence is that the word i'm looking for the lack of empowerment is uh, well horrifying <laughs> to reuse the word that we've used a few times and malaika absolutely represents the opposite of that she stands up not only for herself but also for her friend and follows her friend into these awful social situations just to be there for her. And everyone needs a Malaika. And she, or Ma, Ma, I don't know how to pronounce her name. <laughs> she is a good friend. She is. We should have listened to this on audiobook. So at least one of us knew how to pronounce the names. But audio as a format doesn't work for either of us. No, it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what we're doing right now. So we have no excuse. <laughs> womp womp. Uh, this definitely like put my heart through the ringer. Rooting for Nella, even at the point where you, well, as a horror reader, I could kind of tell she wasn't going to come back from. But still really hoping somewhere in my heart of hearts that she would make it. I, I wanted her to. Yeah. Yeah, I, I really wanted her to. I think that like that falls to your point of realistic, but not not yeah. that this is a realistic right. uh, hopefully like, no one's getting chemically brainwashed, but hopefully not. I did find the ending to be very realistic. Like, yeah, of course people aren't always going to beat the bad guy and you know figure out who done it and, and right off into the sunset. Well, there's also the metaphor of someone who is a minority having to represent their entire demographic and how exhausting that is and how perfectly reasonable it is to get too tired to do that anymore. And should that make you a bad guy? Like, just because you belong to this demographic doesn't mean you should have to champion everybody. But also, if you don't, that makes you complacent and there's no good answer. It like it is absolutely a realistic ending for where <laughs> the book was heading. 
but it is not, it was not the ending that I wanted in my heart of hearts. Cool. Of course we want a happy ending. Yeah. I just, and I just enjoy happy endings so much more. Well, yes. But again, <laughs> that's like, that's a me as a reader. Like I don't want to read and be depressed. And I, this book is really, you know, great at, you read it and you're depressed. Well, that's why I feel like this book really wants us to confront our, speaking as two extremely white women, uh, <laughs> visibly, if not ethnically, extremely white women. <laughs> I mean, I'm basically. Yeah. My Japanese doesn't count. It's not visible. Yeah. I'm technically Native American, but I'm the whitest white white <laughs> who's ever whited in the white world. <laughs> and I think this book is depressing to make us talk about it. And I mean, as a writer, Harris did not create an easy narrative. She didn't want us to go, oh, it was bad, but then there was a happy ending. Yay, goodbye. Like, because it is so heart-wrenching and frustrating, it sticks with us and makes it think about it and talk about it. And that feels like the point. Sure. I mean, I think Harris wrote an excellent book. I think Harris is an excellent writer. That's just not necessarily what I want out of a book. <laughs> no, I'm justifying me sounding like an idiot trying to talk <laughs> through my emotions. <laughs> anyway, I would say I'm glad I read this book. It was not an easy read. And I, frankly, the race issues were the easier part because they were something that I was able to say, yeah, I don't love this, but it's important for me to read. And I'm glad that I'm learning about it. Whereas all of the East Coast elitism, I was like, this is miserable and I don't need this in my life. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's maybe, uh, that's a me problem, probably. <laughs> I think, I think that's a you problem. Yeah, I would have enjoyed it a little more if it hadn't actually been horror genre. If it had stuck to it just being horrible racist workplace policies i'm the other um, way and around political maneuvering. <laughs> i wanted more horror <laughs> oh this is like the perfect example of how we're opposite readers sometimes <laughs> we, we really are <laughs> i'm glad that i've read it and i'm glad that you added it to the podcast schedule i wouldn't read it again probably but not because it shouldn't be read again just because it's not you know as i've said it's it's not the book for me but it was a it was a good book. I think the one thing every reader can agree on after reading this book is fuck Richard Wagner. Yes. He's an asshole. I mean, he's worse than an asshole. Assholes at least are fun sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. He I mean, doesn't even deserve he, that epithet. He he is a he is a a uh, horror villain, horror novel villain. He is that. Actually, he's an actual monster. <laughs> yes. And uh, he can go die in a pit. So one thing that I struggled with reading The Other Black Girl immensely was that I was reading the ebook, which is normally fine, except... I was reading the Kindle version, and I had to see other people's highlights, and that completely ruined the experience for me. I feel like you can turn that off. I don't know if that's true. I don't think I have it turned off in mine, but I feel like that's an option. If it's not an option, it should be. God, I hope it is, because this book has some moments that are fairly poignant and thoughtful, but... Getting to that paragraph in the book and seeing it underlined makes me feel like a kindergartner. And it just made me so mad. I was like, don't tell me that this is important. Let me figure it out for myself. And having it separated out from the rest of the text like that made it feel so trite. And it completely ruined the effect. You can turn off popular highlights. So this is entirely my own fault. <laughs> I have <laughs> what confirmed. you're saying. <laughs> yes, but they don't make it. I mean, to be fair, I had to Google it uh -huh. because a cursory like look to try to figure out how to do it 
on my own didn't help. So they don't make it intuitive, but it is an option. I was correct. It is an option. This is not a problem that I have had. Well, I guess a lot of the eBooks that we read aren't big enough to have popular highlights. I think it's only an issue when you buy the book from the Kindle store. And a lot of the books that we read as an ebook, we get the EPUB or Mobi file from the author. I also rent ebooks from the library, but I, I don't think that I get popular highlights from those. Yeah, I would be surprised because I feel like that's probably a different like Version. listing. Yeah. Technically, yeah. Well, it kind of ruined this book for me. <laughs> Just having someone go, oh, this is poignant, really makes the line feel stupid. It's not the author's fault. It's just having that expectation set up, like, really ruins it. Yeah. I think, on the one hand, I find it really interesting to to see what people highlight or, or what Amazon considers, like, a popular highlight. And I don't know what metrics they use to gauge that. So. I do find it interesting, but I agree that sometimes you're like, this is setting up an expectation that if I didn't see this, like, you know, other people have liked, I would really like this line. But because I'm seeing this, it just makes it feel hokey. It really broke the flow. Yeah. It made those lines stand out in a bad way because Mm -hmm. they were all commentary, or at least the ones that were popular highlights for me I assume it's universal maybe not I don't know how Amazon works I think it's universal I mean I think I think that these are highlights that enough people have highlighted that it shows up for everyone not well apparently it's a bunch of guilty white people going yeah that is a problem (laughs) and I don't need Amazon to point that out for me (laughs) it just made it feel dumb and basic and it completely ruined the effect of a very thoughtful comment because I was just going, <laughs> That's not an issue that I had reading the physical copy. Oh, good. I fully intended to buy this book as a physical copy and then I took too long. <laughs> and this is just further proof that I should have. <laughs> I mean, I feel like that's often the case with the books that you intend to read as a physical copy. <laughs> Well, yeah, but then there's also the books that I never intend to buy that I just borrow from the library. But but that's a whole separate yeah. thing. <laughs> this was definitely a book that I intended to own. I mean, I own it as an ebook, which was a mistake. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Fiction Fans. Come disagree with us. We're on Twitter and Instagram at FictionFansPod. You can also email us at FictionFansPod at gmail.com. If you enjoyed the episode, please rate and review on Spotify and Apple Podcasts and follow us wherever your podcasts live. We also have a Patreon where you can support us and find our show notes when Lily remembers to upload them and a lot of other nonsense. Thanks again for listening, and may your villains always be defeated. Bye!